Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar about making a proposal for the 2023 Forum on Workplace Inclusion calendar year. We are so very happy to have so many of you joining us today. We know more will be joining us, of course, as we go through the about approximate hour that we had together. Um, I have to say I'm looking very forward to reading your proposals. I've already read about 20 uh, that have been submitted so far. And some of them are just amazing. I was like big yeses and exclamation points when I read some of them this, earlier this week. So uh, I'm looking forward to reading yours as well and hopefully getting similar responses as I read them. Um, a note to tell you that this webinar is being live streamed on Facebook, so you will be able to uh, watch it on there as well. To start off, we want to get to know you a little bit better and maybe to help you get to know each other too. So we're going to do a, just a quick couple of poll questions. And here is the first one. Have you attended the forum conference before? Let's see what it says. So far, we're about a 50-50 situation. That's excellent. All right, that's a pretty good response. Um, what I have to say about that is, one, really excited to see the new folks who are looking to propose for the forum and really also excited to see the folks who uh, are our returnees because you obviously had a great experience, which is exactly what we want for you. And we're looking forward to that for everybody. So the next question for those of you uh, uh, who have been to the forum before, have you presented at the forum before? So that's the next question. I, I, I like that response as well. So yes, we have some returning presenters, but we also have folks who have been attendees in the past, participants in the conference, but, have, uh, but uh, are now interested in presenting. I, I love that, absolutely. And then of course, our final question, how many times, if you have presented the forum before, how many times have you presented? Is it one? or two or four or five or more, because we have people who have done indeed more than five presentations over the past 30 something years that we've been an, an organization. So let's see what we got. All right. I love that answer. We've got some, a long-term returnee uh, on, 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 the, on the webinar today and people who have presented multiple times and a few presented just one or two times. Excellent. All right. Thanks everyone for those. Michaela, we can go on and start talking about the forum itself, right? So uh, just to give everyone a bit of a background about what the forum is all about. Um, we, are, we, are, we are working with people, of course, who have all kinds of, of experience with diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, and we try to remind ourselves that all of our presenters and all of our participants that indeed this DEI stuff is a journey that begins within and that journey is never over. We are always evolving uh, as we go through our lives. I, I've been doing this for 20 years and every year is a new experience for me. Every year, every day, every month, I learn something new, right? And our participants at the forum are no different. And just to say that, to underscore that, uh, the forum attracts people at all stages of where they are in their DEI journey. And so our job is to meet them where they are and try to offer them presentations that will help them get, get along the path on that journey. And then a final thing just to set the stage is that, yes, this is the forum on workplace inclusion, but what affects the workplace uh, um, it happens in society and society affects the workplace. And it's a hopefully virtuous circle of, 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 of uh, influence back and forth between the workplace and society and back. So that is just kind of a bit of the framework of what the forum is all about. You can go to the next slide, Michaela. So our focus and direction at the forum, our purpose, strategic systemic change. Our job is to change what happens in the workplace. And as I said in the previous slide, also what happens in society. Our value proposition, we are conveners and curators. We bring uh, expert presentation from around the world and then bring people together to learn from those expert presenters uh, with the mission of engaging people, advancing those ideas, and then of course, igniting that change, that systemic strategic change. 
Uh, we are a learning platform. Everything we do is centered around learning and development in the DEI space. But what we've discovered because of the way we've approached that learning, that it is uh, inclusive, that it is co-creational, that it is interactive with small group work, we have learned that it also builds a sense of community. When people work together in small groups, even briefly, or even more extendedly uh, in some of our presentations, they get a sense of who each other are and they can build a level of trust and a sense of belonging with those people they're working with. And that builds a sense of community through the learning process that they have been in. So your role, if we're the curators and conveners, your role is as the creators. We are searching the earth to find you to make presentations at our uh, conferences and events. And so that makes you the creators of this process. Uh, the other aspect that you present, not just your creative ideas, is your facilitation of the learning of the people in whatever presentation you are a part of. Because, any, because we have people in, the, in our workshops who could possibly present the same presentation you are presenting, we wanna make sure that everyone is a part of this conversation. So whether they're the most advanced person in the room who could be a co-presenter with you or someone who's absolutely new to their DEI journey, Every one of us has expertise, experience, life, life situations that we have been through um, that we can all learn from. And so we want our presenters to be facilitators of that learning, inviting all the participants in their presentation to be a part of that conversation, to be a part of that learning, to be a part of what is happening in that space. So that's a little bit about kind of our value proposition. I want to talk a little bit more now about our strategies. So. The, form of the, the goal of the forum is to be a leader in this space, to be a trusted source for DEI learning uh, uh, for both, of course, in the US and North America and around the world. We do that, of course, by con curating content from all over the place. And we curate that content from people we build alliances and forge alliances with, which indeed are all of you. You are, of course, partners in this process. We bring you to the world and what you bring to the world is your great expertise and your presentation skills. And hopefully by doing that leading and that curating and foraging, we can grow a truly global community together, both here in the US and around the world. Now, a little bit about who actually participates in the forum. So they are leaders and managers of diverse workplaces. They work in HR, they work in diversity. They are ERG members and leaders and diversity council members and leaders. Uh, they work in organizational development, and they're also academics and students, people from all the kind of different parts of um, an organization that you can imagine. That Those are our participants. And then also, in the next slide, you will see that we represent multiple sectors. So yes, we have a lot of folks from corporate, but a, a large number come from government, from healthcare, from the military, nonprofits, higher education. Those are all the different segments uh, that are represented in the forum participant pool. About half of them, a little more than half of them, work in HR or DEI, as you would expect. It is a diversity conference, right? Uh, and other learning events that are diversity focused. But as you can see, over 40% of our participants don't work in this space. Uh, they do everything else. Um, they, I've had a CEO of a financial company and a, and a, uh, um, a supervisor in an oil field all attending in the same year, a couple of years back. So we represent people who work in the space every day and other people who simply live their lives in a diverse way, of course. And many of them are indeed new to these DEI principles. Um, as you can also see, we have a growing millennial Gen Z population about 40%. 75% of our attendees and participants are women. Maybe we need to get a few more men involved in the conference and learning opportunities. As you can also see, we're about 45% uh, people who are white. And then as you can see, about 30% African-American, uh, Hispanic Latinx about 11%, Asian about seven to 8%. Um, and one thing I wanna call out really quite a bit here is the learning levels. Look at that, fully 45% of the people that come to the forum events believe they're advanced. They may not be advanced in every aspect in every subject area in the DEI space, but in, in the general sense, they are advanced folks. That means we really do need and want 
presentations that are really aimed for these truly advanced people in the DEI space. So things like think tanks or case studies, challenging issues that don't have easy answers to lead them through a thought process that helps them understand their space in the DEI space better, as well as how they can do the work that they're doing in DEI at a much higher level. So that's just a little bit about our participants in the demographic side. We also know that they bring to us multiple learning styles. I uh, am a spatial visual learner and a verbal learner. That's how I learn. Some of these other uh, learning styles just don't work for me, but we have people coming to the forum who represent all of these seven learning styles. So just keep that in mind as you put together your proposals. And now a bit of kind of the organization, organizational process behind the forum in the learning tracks that we have. We can go to the next slide, Michaela. So these learning tracks are not um, meant to trip you up in any way. Uh, they're really organizing principles for the, the people who are, are attending any of our conferences or, or other learning events. So we have things on strategy and we have things on leadership. And we have things that are innovative or are social responsibility right, related. Then we also have you know, the tracks where, we're, like I said, we have government employees and healthcare employees and military and nonprofit folks. So all of those are possible uh, presentations as well. Um, and then you see things like global diversity there or technology. Uh, sometimes we have organized them as uh, a multiple sessions divided into a global track, for example. Other times we have placed those sessions across the spectrum of these other tracks because some of them might be strategic, some of them might be leadership based, but all in a global perspective as an example, in which case we will designate them as global. So we've gone back and forth in those ways. Technology is another one we've done that as well. Where we've gone back and forth between actually assigning them a track and, and having multiple sessions all in that track and other times where we have allowed them to float to wherever the best track was for them and then designate them as global or technology or otherwise. So that's just a little bit about that organizing principle. The other one, of course, are the learning levels. Um, Introduction, introductory, intermediate, and advanced. And as you can see here, these definitions are, are have been uh, they were created many years ago, actually, but they have done really well by us. They give kind of different ways of you, of you to consider how someone might be introductory versus advanced or intermediate. Uh, in every case, what we ask when you assign uh, a level of learning, what we, are at, what we do ask for is that you go to the very highest level of that level of learning. So that introductory session might be just underneath that intermediate or that intermediate might just be under the advanced level. So we're always challenging our participants to push themselves to the, the edge, to the limit of what they might be able to do. All right, now it's time to talk about this calendar year that's coming up 2023. And of course, talking about the actual theme for the year. When uh, I talked about the strategy a bit, what did we say? We talked about the fact that we curate content and we do that by building alliances and partnerships with others. And that is all about what our 2023 calendar year theme is about, combining forces. And you see the X there, the exponential X, that by combining forces, it's more than just one plus one. One plus one here can equal three or four or five, because when we work together, we're able to accomplish things that we cannot do alone. And so while this is an organizing principle for your proposals to come into us, uh, it is not, not every session has to have this as its defining feature. Uh, we still need nuts and bolts things that may not have anything to do with combining forces, we just need skill building, right? Uh, so we definitely are looking for proposals that are just simply skill building in whatever way that may need to be. But also we're looking for these really dynamic presentations that help us understand how best we can combine our forces and using our collective capacity to make change, which is of course, like I said, what the forum is all about. On to the next slide, Michaela. So a little bit about the kind of events we're planning for our 365 days of 2023. Um, we have a new format that we uh, initiated this year. The first one of this year was just a couple of weeks ago and we're working on a couple more. Uh, these are the professional development labs. These are four hour, five hour events with, with breaks built in, of course, uh, that really help people deep dive into content in, in a timeline that's not during the annual conference. Uh, and that really help 
plan act, action planning, uh, help them with action planning so that once they've learned the content that's being presented, they can put together a plan for what they need to do after this PDL, this professional development lab is over, whether that's in the next week or the next month or the next year, both for them personally, as well as them professionally for the organizations. So that's what PDLs are about. Now, the diversity executive forum, of course, we've done for many, many years, but we're looking to start doing it not only perhaps during the conference in the spring, but also as a standalone event, which would make it a new uh, entity for us. Uh, and of course, you can see this other new uh, event, this full day fall virtual conference. Um, it's something new for us to think about. People are asking for forum events throughout the year and more than just podcasts, more than just webinars you see there, but more um, organized and lengthy uh, presentations. And so we're considering doing sometime next fall, uh, fall of 2023, uh, a, a virtual conference that is a full one day. Uh, kind of similar to what we did in 21 and 22 in the virtual space, but only one day long, of course. So that's a little bit about some of the events that we're planning for that you can propose for um, in, in, in this call for proposals process, but that's all 365 days. Now we're going to talk about the actual annual conference coming up in March, March 27th through 29, which is an in-person conference. We have enlisted a hotel. Uh, you're in Minneapolis, the Hilton uh, Minneapolis Hotel, which has a whole lot of presentation rooms for us to work in, and a ballroom that can seat almost 2,000 people should we, should we have that many people want to attend the conference in uh, 2023. Um, let's go to the next slide, Michaela, because there we'll see a little bit about the demographics of the 2022 conference to give you an idea of how people kind of sort out. So a little history building up into next year's conference. So we had a little over a thousand people involved in 2022, the virtual version of our conferences. 174 of them were presenters. As you can see, we had a lot of coaching sessions. A lot of people participated in coaching. We had all, a record number of businesses involved, almost 550. Um, a lot of volunteers at 44, although we will need in the in-person world more volunteers than that. Uh, one of the things that's a huge uh, exciting thing is that we had 22 countries represented. Some of those are presenters, a lot of them are participants, and that's a record number for us. We've never had that many countries involved before. And if you look at the country list, uh, that is across, across the globe. Uh, one of our very first uh, registrants in 2022 was from Singapore, um, which was really exciting. But we have folks from South Africa and from India and from Chile uh, and across Europe. Uh, and across North America. Uh, and then of course, 42 states plus DC and the Virgin Islands uh, all represented. So that's a little bit of where we were in the virtual space. And of course, moving into the in-person space again, um, it's gonna be interesting to see how people are able to travel, but we do plan to do a virtual version of the forum as well. So there will be multiple options. Let's look at the next slide, Michaela. So some of the things that we're planning for the 2023 conference in March, some of the things you'll recognize that are coming back. So like the awards ceremony and the course coaching, because that has been highly successful. Uh, obviously, we'll be doing a lot of in-person networking. We'll bring back a new and reimagined uh, marketplace of ideas, which is sometimes thought of as an, uh, an exhibit show, but it's so much more than that. Um, We'll still have on-demand opportunities, so things will be recorded at the in-person conference so that people can watch them um, in real time or in, uh, in post-conference afterwards. Um, we'll be bringing back workshops, of course, but with different lengths uh, proposed for, uh, for 2023. Some things that are new, we're going to try to go as green as we possibly can and not actually have a program book in the in the in-person world and actually do everything through a conference app. We upgraded our, uh, our systems at the forum, uh, and uh, that will make the app, uh, I think, much more user-friendly for everybody. Uh, we're hoping to have experiential learning opportunities. Uh, and of course, as I said, a hybrid or virtual version of the forum uh, so that the folks that came from around the world or the folks who aren't able to afford to travel to Minneapolis because of time or money um, are able to still participate in the conference in some way or another. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Michaela. 
So I've already talked a little bit about some of the formats, but here is a list of them. So the trend talks, which have been very popular, 20 minutes, um, uh, kind of a deep, a, a quick and hard look at some really challenging uh, aspects of DEI work. Um, we have our workshop sessions. And as you can see, as I said, multiple lengths. And so 60, 75, and 90, each of them kind of building with the extra time available uh, from a more basic presentation to a more in-depth presentation. And then our few hour sessions um, that we're hoping to be highly interactive, uh, might be experiential and might be things like think tanks. So you can keep that in mind as you propose things. And then the other uh, co conference format is the Spotlight series, which are pre-recorded. So these are definitely in the virtual space. Um, we'll probably have five, six or seven or eight of those. Uh, and they're 45 to 60 minute presentations that are pre-recorded. So in this case, of course, interactivity is not what we're looking for, uh, but actual presentation. Um, I think let's go to the next slide, Michaela, because we can always answer questions at the end. I already see we have several questions in the Q&A. Um, who is the program committee? Uh, I am not the only person who looks at your proposals. We actually have a group of 25 folks, 21 of them are, are confirmed right now, and we've got a couple invitations out for the other four. They are a cross-sector group of practitioners. I want to underscore practitioners from across the U.S. Um, and from multiple sectors. So yeah, corporate, of course, but all different kinds of corporate, the retail sector and the manufacturing sector and whatever other kinds, there might be the financial sectors, for example. Um, but they also represent healthcare and nonprofits and government. Uh, we bring them all together, um, these 25 folks, and we divide them into five smaller groups. So five groups of five people. And each one of them receives the same group of proposals that you submit and they'll be divided by topic. So one of the small groups will get all the ERG sessions and one of the small groups will get all the LGBTQ sessions or religion sessions or even strategy sessions or leadership, leadership sessions so that they're all reviewing the same thing. But when we do give them to those later in this month, they will not have any identifying information with them. They will be uh, rating your proposals without knowing who proposed the proposal. So you, they won't know who you are. Um, we scrub all that information out of, of the proposals you submit so that they're getting kind of the raw data. Um, and they do a, 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 a rating for us, a one to five rating with about 10 to 12 questions uh, that we ask them about the proposal. So we can understand some of them are logistical, some of them are, are very much content-based. Do we believe these people really know what they're talking about? Or are we confused about what they're talking about? That happens sometimes too. But then we bring them together on August 18th for multiple hours. Um, we do a bit of um, a deep dive on the theme and other things we're looking for as a group. And then we split them into those same small groups. And now all the information is revealed. They now know uh, who you are uh, connected to your proposal. They also know the, 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 the ratings that were given, the aggregate ratings and the individual ratings and all the comments that were made are all revealed to the small groups. And now they get to deliberate. Um, they, they, we give them, they probably will get about 40 proposals to, to deliberate, to read and deliberate on. And we don't allow them to say yes to more than about seven. And then there are seven maybes and everyone else goes into the no category. A couple of years ago, the program committees themselves came up with a, an innovative way to expand that horizon a bit. And so as they work through those 40 proposals, they end up at some point where they have way more than seven proposals they really like. And so they actually created a maybe plus category. So the proposals that were yeses uh, originally, but maybe they liked another one even better and got bumped down to the next category, actually have this extra maybe plus category. So they're very creative people. Um, but they give me all those recommendations. And then I spend the rest of August all the way through November making decisions, trying to find a balanced uh, um, a conference year uh, and event year, uh, both the 365 events and the actual conference in March to try to find as many topics as possible at as many learning levels as I can to, to really make sure that we have a good mix of presentations so that 
everybody has what they're looking for when they attend a forum event. I actually sort by about 155 different topics uh, that I'm looking for. I usually, in any given year, and particularly within the conference, usually get about 100 topics represented out of that 155. So that's a, that's a pretty good indication that we've got a good mix of things that people are really talking about, um, as well as, of course, the introductory, the intermediate, and advanced levels of learning are represented. So that's, what, that's what's happening from the time you submit and we close the call for proposals process all the way through November when we actually tell you what your status is, a yes or a wait list or a no. Um, there's a lot that goes into that process and a lot of really crazy long spreadsheets that we have to create in order to be able to sort all the information that you provided us. Um, I think my spreadsheet usually is somewhere around 1,200 lines uh, in a spreadsheet and around 15 to 20 different columns, just sorting information. So that is why it takes us so long from the time we close uh, uh, the call in July until November to get you your answers to why, uh, what, what we wanna do with your proposal. Now, I wanna turn it over to Ben Rue, who can then lead you through the actual process of the call. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, for our call for proposals webinar. So as Stephen mentioned, I am going to be just walking you through the um, actual process of submitting a proposal. So the first step is you're going to um, form workplaceinclusion.org or um, forward slash CFP in order to submit your in order to submit the proposal. I'm going to go ahead and go to that. Welcome to the Call for Proposals page. This is where you'll not only submit your proposals for the 2023 conference, but also for our year-round learning opportunities. So at the top of the page, we have a brief recap of what is the Call for Proposals, followed by the conference theme and dates, combining forces, fueling our collective capacity for change, March 27th through 29th, 2023. The first step to submitting your proposal is to review the Call for Proposals guidelines and policies. This is a 16 page document um, that you have to review and agree to with when you submit your proposal. So I'm just gonna go over it briefly. Starts with a letter from our executive director, Steve Fummerkaus, followed by our vision, mission, and strategic strategies. Overview of the forum. Another overview of the theme of the conference. Opportunities for engagement. Like I said, we have year round learning and development opportunities with our professional development labs webinars, podcasts, and diversity executive forum. During the conference, we have our trend talks, which are 20 minutes, workshop sessions, which are 60 minutes, featured sessions, which are three hours, and spotlight sessions, which are 45 to 60 minute pre-recorded expositions on important topics critical to future-focused DEI thinking and action. Then we have a sample schedule of the three-day conference proposal expectations and levels of learning. There are three different levels of learning, introductory, intermediate, and advanced. The advanced sessions do require prerequisites as to why they are advanced. Intermediate, such, intermediate levels do not require them, but if you do have prerequisites for your intermediate session, then you can include them. Then we have our topic tracks, which are critical employment practices, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, diversity leadership, innovation and transformation, global diversity, and social responsibility. We have specialty industry tracks, which are higher education, government, healthcare, legal, military, nonprofit, and tech. We have a sample of uh, topics of interest that you could propose on, um, for a wide range from accessibility, advancing underrepresented populations, allies and champions, employment, employee engagement, ethics, global DEI, government initiatives, healthcare, identity, professional development in DEI, polarization, succession planning, technology, trauma, unconscious bias, white men, 
women in leadership, work-life balance, just to name a few. Then we have the application deadlines. The call for proposals opened on June 8th and will be closing on July 15th. There is a full call for proposals webinar on July 12th, which we're doing right now. Then we have the evaluation and selection session. The proposals are evaluated and selected by our, our program committee, which consists of 25 DEI professionals from across the country, actually from across the world. Um, so there will be a orientation before you submit your proposal. No. Which, like I said, we have, we've already had one and we have another one coming up on July 12th. Yeah. Then timeline and policies. August 18th is when the program committee will be reviewing proposals. November 22nd is when the pro selected proposals will be notified. December 2nd is the deadline to confirm your participation. December 16th is when session date and time will be emailed to presenters. January 20th is the deadline to submit edits to your session if there are any. We understand that there, you know, things change between when you submitted your proposal in June to, you know, January or March when the, when the conference is. So we, um, you are allowed to make ch changes to your proposal up to January 20th. February 17th is the deadline for complimentary presenter registration. March 20th, all handouts and slide decks must be uploaded to the conference platform. And March 27th through 29th are the conference dates. And then we just go on to present presentation policies, benefits and additional information, presenter benefits, um, continuing education credits, guest attendance policy, marketing, sponsorship opportunities, video recordings, and our contact information if you have any questions. Now that we've gone through that, we are going to go to step two, which is to actually begin the process. So one, um, now that we are at this, uh, this submission page, first thing you're gonna do is wanna scroll down to where it says begin. And even if you submitted proposals in the past, you will need to click on click need to create an account to create an account using your, um, put it in a name, email, and a new password. Now I've already done this, so I'm gonna go ahead and just cancel that and just log in. Let's see, one second. Be sure to save your password so you don't have to go through that what I just had to go through. So um, so now I'm logged in, so I will actually go to the home page. You won't have to do this because it'll be your first time, but I have to go that and go back to begin. And now this will take you to the page where you will have been taken after you put in your username and password. Um, we pre-populated with any information that we have saved about you. You can put in your social media handles. Your headshot is, is required and bio. This is also where you add if you have any co-presenters or panelists. You can add up to three co-presenters, so total of four presenters slash panels in the presentation, including you. So if you add the pre uh, co-presenter, you just click here to add their information, same as yours. Also, headshot and bio are also required. I do not have a co-presenter, so I'm just gonna remove my co-presenter from that and save and continue. So this is uh, step two is where you'd enter the information about the actual workshop. So I, you're either going to do the, if you're doing for annual conference, select whether you're doing a 20 minute trend talk, 60 minute workshop, 75 minute workshop, 90 minute workshop, featured session or spotlight session. Or if you're doing something for the 365, either professional development lab, webinar, podcast, or diversity executive forum presentation, you could select from here. It is possible to submit a proposal, the same proposal for both categories. And I'll go over that, how you can do that a little bit later. But I'm gonna go with the annual conference and do a 60 minute workshop. And this first section here is really the, what the participants are gonna see. So this is really where you really wanna market your your workshop. So you want this information to be as 
accurate and specific as possible. The session title, I'm just gonna say TBD. And then description, also TBD. Learning outcomes. So you need to enter at least three measurable learning outcomes. And just a note that you should not put all three in the first box. So we'll put first learning outcome in the first box, and the second learning outcome in the second box, and the third learning outcome in the third box. Do not put all three in one box. Next question is gonna be the level of learning. Once again, there are three different levels of learning, introductory, intermediate, and advanced. I'm going to choose inter intermediate. And since I chose intermediate, I don't, uh, prerequisites are not allowed. They are optional, but I do not have any. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put NA in that field. And if you if your presentation is advanced, do please describe what will be presented in the session that is appropriate for an advanced audience. So be as specific as possible. Next, I'm going to choose my track, which is gonna be diversity, equity, inclusion strategies. Keep in mind, we do reserve the right to change the track if necessary. And the state, the topic of your presentation. Now this is your case for the program committee. This will not be seen by participants, but really more by the program committee. And so this is where you want to be, share what information you will represent and how you will present to the attendees and what background information you will use, like best practices, case studies, data, et cetera. I'm gonna go TBD there. And are, are there other formats you would like this, us to consider this proposal for? So this is where, like I mentioned before, if your proposal can be done in multiple formats, this is what, one of the places you would um, say where you would submit that. So if you, if it can be done in multiple formats, like how would it be different from the original? So I'm going to say that mine can also be done as a webinar and, uh, yeah, it can also be done as a webinar with less interaction, so no breakout rooms. Then you just save and continue. Next step would be the logistics of your presentation. Now, the first thing and the more and the most important things for the forum is accessibility. All, all materials and presentations must be available in an ADA accessible format. Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Adobe, Acrobat, and Google Crackle all provide an accessibility checker feature. The accessibility checker verifies your file against a set of rules and identify possible issues for people who have disabilities. Um, it can reference back to the guidelines for a primer on how to make accessible documents. All handouts and slides must pass the accessibility checker. So the next question is, do you comply? Do you agree to comply with the accessibility requirements stated above, of course? And presentation interactivity. So describe how you will incorporate interactive participants into an in-person and virtual event. Use specific examples of exercises, methods, and learning tools you will use to facilitate learning. So this is uh, how you would be in with a hybrid event, how you'd be have interactivity both in person and virtually. So interact in person, breakout rooms. Virtual interactivity. That it's still to be decided, but it says, please include about your virtual presentation experience. I mean, we all have experience from, well, most have experience from doing virtual presentations over the past almost two years. So I'm just gonna say 2021, 2021 conference. Is there maximum capacity to run your session effectively? whether it's in person or virtual. I'm going to say 50. And yes, my, well, no, my virtual presentation, will my virtual presentation include breakout rooms? Yes, and I'm gonna say the maximum participant per breakout room is 10, so I'm gonna say 10. Panelists and for me, presenters, how will you host a session 
featuring multiple presenters, whether it's in person or virtual. So this is basically how you just describing how you would hand, how present with a panel. This is not where you put the panel's information. Panel's information would go in the beginning there when you entered the presenter and co-presenter information. I don't have any panelists, I'm gonna say NA. If you or any of your co-presenters require ADA specific needs, please provide details here. I'm gonna say NA. And describe what tools, i.e. models, metrics, processes, tips, participants can apply when they return to workplace as a result of your session. So please provide at least three, say models, metrics, processes. And participants expect the full and the form requires handouts during, during or prior to a session to assist with understanding, note-taking, and post-conference learning. So which of the following will you provide a session materials? Check all that apply. And this, keep in mind, this does not apply to podcasts or trend talks. However, if you do, if you are submitting a podcast or a trend talk and you do have handouts or um, any kind of materials that would assist in learning, you can definitely feel free to um, include those as well and we will share them. So I'm gonna go with assist, assessments, PowerPoint presentation, polling. And for in-person presentations, the forum determines room set based on schedule, number of conference participants and pedagogy of the session. The standard room comes with head table, round table, seating with six to eight participants per table, LCD projector and screen, dongle cords required for those using MacBooks, but are not provided by the forum, wireless internet connection, sound feed for video clips, two microphones, one lapel, one wireless handheld, remote PowerPoint slide advancer, two flip charts with stands and markers. Again, the form does not provide laptops or dongle cords. This setup does not apply for Trend Talks, which have their own predetermined AV and setup. For Trend Talks, the 20 minute presentations take place in the forum's marketplace of ideas and are equipped with an LCD projector, and screen wireless internet with a sound feed, one laptop mic, one lap, one lapel microphone, and a flip chart with markers. A laptop is provided to Trend Talk sessions. Please note that due to short length of the trend of a Trend Talk presentation, a max of four PowerPoint slides are allowed. So, does this does your session require unique equipment or a different room set to better facilitate learning? If no, the standard room set will be provided. Last minute requests for changes to room sets cannot be accommodated. So the, and again, the form does not provide laptops or dongle cords. So I don't need any special or room set that work, the current room set works for me. So I'm gonna do save and continue. So one of the last questions, is there any additional information the program committee should consider while reviewing your presentation? This is where you can include things like OIs, oh, been featured in this magazine or um, or mentioned th or white papers you may have or uh, books that you've published. I'm just gonna put TBD for now. And if you're selected, how do you intend to market your presentation? So company email, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Would you like to receive a complimentary 2023 form on workplace inclusion conference cross promotional digital marketing kit? Yes, I would. Would you be interested in becoming a contributor writer for the forum publications? Yes. And we, with regard to that, we are, you know, we just started a forum newsletter and we will, are looking into doing a blog as well. So um, if you are interested in submitting, please let us know. And one of the final steps is if you have any documents that will support your presentation, please upload them. So again, like white papers or anything you've been published in that you think would support that you would upload it here. And this is an uh, important submission of this presentation. Proposal is an agreement that you have read, understand, and agree to policies outlined within the presentation guidelines and policies document on the forum website. If you haven't, please follow the link below to read it. And here's a link to the back to the presentation guidelines. Finally, I consent to having the forum on workplace inclusion collect and store my personal information as entered into this proposal 
submission form, I understand that I can request this information be removed at any time by contacting the form directly. I accept. You can hit save and continue. So this is the final stage where you would review your submission. So just going through there. If everything looks good, you would hit submit. If there's something that you want to change on the previous page, just hit previous. Or if you want to go back to the beginning, there's a button here on the top that says return to submission form. But I'm going to go ahead and hit submit. And once it's been submitted, you'll be taken to the screen. It says, congratulations, you have successfully committed, completed your submission. If you have any questions, please email workplaceforum at augsburg.edu. And that is it. And then you should request, you should receive a confirmation email from the form letting you know that your submission is in, uh, that you received. You can also go right here to my submissions to see your submission. If you want to submit yet another proposal, you would just go to home and then just go to begin again and then start the process all over again. That's another way you could submit a proposal, the uh, same proposal in a different format or multiple proposals. Thank you so much for, for, for watching and let, please email if you have any questions. Thank you, That's Ben. And so that is um, the process for submitting a proposal. The, the, um, sorry, one second. So, um, it's process for submitting a proposal. As I mentioned in the bit and in, in, in that, uh, that recording about accessibility, um, this is just a reminder and that it, there is a, to a link to learn more in the um, in the guidelines, but you can also um, reference the creating accessible content document created by Augsburg University class office. Benefits for presenters. So benefits, benefits um, for featured sessions, spotlight, trend talks, workshop pre uh, presenters, uh, complimentary full conference registration, networking at the largest workplace diversity conference in the country and additional benefits to be announced um, for the diversity executive forum call um, fall conference podcast professional development labs and webinars it's uh, also complimentary full conference registration and networking at the largest workplace diversity conference in the country so we have um up important dates coming up that were covered already but just a reminder that July 15th is when the call for proposals closes. Um, so that is just, that is this Friday. Um, and then the program committee will begin reviewing them. And then they will, we'll convene to re uh, review them on August 18th. And then notices will be emailed to presenters November 22nd. Now we're gonna go ahead and hand things over to our fearless leader, Steve Hummerkos once again. Hello again. Um, Michaela, we can go to the next slide. Um, I am taking the place of Ender Goatsman, who was our marketing director, but Ender left us just last week to open his own company, uh, his own business, actually roasting coffee, which is a very, a very different experience, I imagine. Uh, but we appreciate his four, almost four and a half years that he was with us. And we will be looking, of course, for a new marketing director uh, uh, once we get all settled on that. Uh, Michaela, we can go to the next slide. So we want to talk a little bit about marketing. Yeah, there we go. So um, one of the best ways that you can uh, promote the forum is by promoting yourself, of course. Uh, and that's being an ambassador for us. Word of mouth marketing, talking to your clients, talking to your colleagues, uh, talking to your friends, people who are interested in diversity, equity, inclusion, all of them are possible participants in any of the forum events, whether that's a webinar or a podcast or the conference itself or any of the other things that we might be doing throughout the year. Uh, so your recommendation uh, is hugely important and hugely effective to bringing people to forum events. And, and then, of course, 
them, of course, participating in your presentations. So spread the word, word champion your work, and of course, our work with you. Um, if you get e-blasts from us, send them forward, uh, recruit those participants, subscribe to our email addresses, and of course, using our resources, as Ben mentioned, in the application process for the call for proposals, there is uh, there are a couple questions about how you will how you will um, communicate about your form participation, or if you'd like to write for us, anything like that. You'd like our marketing packets. So those are all different ways that you can become this form ambassador, uh, both promoting your work and, of course, our work as we convene and curate around your work. Uh, we can go to the next uh, slide. There we go. Perfect. So um, we do a lot of social media. Uh, and I'll show those uh, handles to you in just a moment. Uh, if you want to contact us about any kind of marketing opportunities in, and, and there's absence and until we get a new uh, employee to handle marketing for us, you can simply uh, email us at Workplace Forum, our main box at Augsburg, uh, and uh, Michaela will then send us out, send it out to the right person on the forum staff uh, and we can get back to you from that. And then to the next slide, Getting social. So here are the different places that we are showing up in social media, of course, at Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, and, and then also um, on YouTube. Um, all of them are pretty much, you know, a standard format for us, Workplace Forum, except for the YouTube channel, which was created a very long time ago when we actually had a different name. Um, so I think that probably covers everything except, of course, your questions, right? And so I know we have questions in the Q&A and we also have questions in chat. I think I'll just open Q&A first just to see what we have there. Um, and then we'll just run them down, right? So Jaylene asks, what is the process submitting a proposal to be presented virtually if we're unable to be there in person? And I think the best answer to that is submit as a, as a virtual presentation. So do the actual application, answer all the questions in person, might. When, when we get to that, how do we interactive in person, for example, maybe put an NA there and then put virtual, you know, tell us how you would present virtually. Of course, if you're proposing for a webinar or a podcast or a PDL, those things are virtual by, by definition. But if it's for the conference itself, then what I would think I would do is, and that last question where it says, what other information would you like to provide to tell us about um, your proposal? That's where I think I'd say, I am unable to be person physically present at the conference, I want to be considered for the virtual aspect of the forum. So that's probably the easiest way to do that. Go through the application just as you would, and then let us know at the end that you, you um, if you're applying for the conference, which is in person, that you want to be considered for the virtual version of that. We're right now thinking about a parallel process where we have an in-person and a virtual conference more or less running at the same time. Uh, we have different uh, uh, workshops and different benefits and different offerings, depending on whether it's in person or virtual. Uh, let's see. Sarah says, my session could be 90 or three hours as it involves practical application skills. How should I determine which option, should, option to choose? Well, as Ben said, you can choose, uh, you need to choose one, obviously, 90 or the, the featured session version, the three hour version. Um, and then whatever one you base it on, then in that other information space or the other format space, you can tell us what would be different about that. My session, I've gotten several proposals. I've read this last week, like, you know, I could do a 75, I could do a 90, I could do three, literally multiple options. Um, uh, and I think, I think it might just be best to choose the one that's your preference and tell us what the other option is um, uh, in, that, in that question. Um, I will say that oftentimes I do ask people to do something they didn't even propose. So I have made podcasts into 90 minute sessions. I have made 90 minute sessions into trend talks. I have asked sometimes trend talk people to do a three hour presentation. Um, and that's kind of a negotiation that we'll get to um, in uh, September, October timeline. Uh, so be open to the options, but let me know what your options are because if I've got a slot and I really want your presentation, but I think there's so much more you could give me, or I don't have a, a slot available, but you are able to maybe fill another format. I want to have the flexibility to be able to, to ask you that question, where you do a 75 instead of a 90 or whatever it might be. Um, Rebecca asks, is there a limit on the number of proposals? No. Um, you can propose as many as you like. We have definitely had years when one 
uh, presenter, one proposer, uh, proposed seven different presentations. Uh, and I think we took a couple of them, several of them. We usually try to max out at not more than three presentations by any one individual, um, just to say it, but you can certainly propose any number of them. And then of course, you can also give us the different formats for the absolute same topic, as I said in the previous question. Um, an anonymous attendee says, on the section about what tools would be used, you put models, metrics, and process examples. Since it says to be specific, please an example of how you might add what you would say about the models, metrics, or processes. I'm doing a proposal on behalf of someone else. I want to make sure I just get it right. So in some ways, it, the details are good, right? But sometimes what you've already talked about in uh, the description of the workshop, uh, the, narrative, the topic narrative area where you're kind of telling us all the details, some of that might be very obvious in it already kind of called out. Um, but there are times when I might ask you a question if I need more information, but oftentimes I'm, I'm just looking to see what your, what some of those, those, those tools would be. Um, and I don't necessarily need all the detail. So if I do want the detail or the program committee wants the detail, I'll certainly be asking if we need more, but try to spell that out as best you can. And, um, and, and we'll sure to get back to you if we need to. Uh, Rebecca says, there's a space on the proposal to say alternate formats. Would you prefer we submit separate proposals or okay in this space to share out a tail of this session to different workshop times or different levels? I, I actually do think it's easier for me um, if you tell me your, your, maybe your best first choice format, and then in that one question, you tell me the details. Um, you can certainly, and as been mentioned, you can certainly propose multiple formats of the same thing. And I have had people do that. But I think for me, it's probably easier for me to keep track of your options uh, if it's all in the one proposal. So then you could tell me, um, I can do this. At, it, it, at, I'm proposing it as a 60 minute, but I could do a 75 or a 90 and here's what would be different. Uh, and even in the definitions of 60, 75 and 90, you see there are already some differences that are, are kind of in the definitions of those because uh, we kind of thought that through first about what's possible in a 60 versus a 90. Uh, but I think just giving me those details, like this is what I would do if it were a longer session or a shorter session. Uh, and sometimes I do, it's like, I don't have room for a 90 minute session, but I do have room for a 60. What would you take out of that? You might get a question from me about that. Um, what would be different? I might surmise that, but I really want to know in your words, what would be different in a shorter session or a longer session? Uh, let's see, Rebecca, I think it's a Rebecca again, I'm submitting proposals under our company name. Should we include company info as if it were another presenter? Um, it's kind of, that's kind of, I've not had that one before, as I, as I recall, uh, because it's the presenter, of course, that we're interested in the expertise of, but it is, of course, about the company. And I will say, I very much want to get proposals from companies that are doing their best practices or what they're, they're working on uh, that others can learn from. Uh, the average participant at a forum event wants to know what their peers are doing. And in most cases, their peers aren't consultants. Their peers are other companies, other organizations that the consultants who are our presenters are working with. And so always bringing uh, the case studies, the examples uh, of, from the company and actually bringing a company representative is really important. In this case, Rebecca, um, you may not actually know who the presenter is, I suppose. I, I think that's kind of what the underlying part of this question is. Uh, um, in which case I would submit as your name and then make it clear that you aren't going to be the presenter if that's the case. Uh, and just tell me more about, about the organization and what you're proposing and that the presenters, you know, like in that question at the end where it says, what more information would you like us to know? And then you could kind of give me an idea of who the presenters might be like by title or something like that. Uh, we can always talk more about that. By the way, I, to say that I'm always happy to take an email or a phone call and talk through things. So just know that that's an option. Um, Candace writes, is there a certain, certain types of language or breakdowns you'd like to see? I'm not sure in what context, um, like as it, in what particular question you're referencing. Um, when I think about language, I think about, sure, we're presenting in English at this point, but then it also might be terminology as well. Um, 
Uh, so Candice, you might need to send me a little more information on that question, or you can always send me an email afterwards as well, because I'm not quite sure I understand your question. I am now going to go over into chat and see what we have over there. Um, realize that I'm looking at a screen that's much bigger so I can, see, I can read your questions better. So uh, I think it's Gina. Uh, Etienne says, for case studies, are these sessions where you walk through the work? Um, yeah, exactly. So, for example, the 75 minute session calls out kind of panels of things, places where you might have people from your organization or the organization you're working with as a consultant um, talk through what they were doing uh, in, in, in their organization. So, that could be considered a case study because you've got the actual people doing the work and talking through it. But in the other way of thinking about case studies, I often think about them uh, as opportunities for more advanced understanding, intermediate and advanced understanding, especially in the advanced phase, because it gives you an example of what one organization did. And then the challenge is, is so do you, the participant, do you agree with how they did that? Would you, how would you have done it differently for their organization? How would you do it differently for your organization? How would you adapt this? So case studies are great ways of, of giving out best practice, but then also examining other ways of looking at that case and other answers uh, for the question that that case may bring up. Think about it in the MBA programs, oftentimes um, they're using Harvard uh, business uh, case examples uh, to show what companies have done, whether right or wrong, and then the opportunity to really deep dive into what the better way might be to do that or how it might adapt to your organization based on the example provided in the case. So I think that answers your question, I hope. Let's see, Rebecca asks, did I share data around audience by industry or can I share more? We actually have some of that, I think on our website, uh, probably in our annual report from last year as well, uh, but essentially, um, probably 40 to 50% of folks are from corporations, uh, from, from multiple sectors. Um, uh, government is probably our next biggest number, sometimes 15 to 20. Nonprofit probably falls straight out after that, along with healthcare probably being pretty similar in size to healthcare. Uh, so um, out of a thousand present, uh, out of a thousand attendees, for example, just to give a number, you know, four to 500 people are probably in some sort of corporate business space uh, and then 15 to 20 percent some of the other bigger areas like government healthcare, or nonprofit. we do have a large nonprofit sector uh, just to say it um, and if you want more detail we can probably share that for sure because we do have it we collect it uh, with every registration process uh, let's see chris is asking can you say a few words about innovation and transformation so this is kind of a squishy track category because indeed, what you might think is innovative, I may not, or what I think is innovative, you might not. And, and so that one's always kind of interesting when I start to think about it um, in, in how to assign proposals into that track. Um, obviously, if something is gonna to totally transform the way people think by virtue of thinking in a very different way, that feels very transformative to me. I actually read a proposal, I think it was on, race yesterday um, that I thought was they assigned it to this track and I agree with them. I thought this would be very transformative that people started to think about race in this way, it would really transform the way we think about race in our organizations. Um, of course, if it's innovative, it's so it's a new idea. And if it's new to me, uh, it probably is innovative because I've read a lot, of course. Um, uh, I may think it's innovative and you might just be kind of normal for you, but for me, if I hadn't read about it, I may want to put it in that track. So it, it's a little squishy and we can always talk about that a little more, uh, uh, you know, in your, in, in, when you submit the proposal, if you want to ask me about where that might be the best place to put uh, your, your uh, proposal, your application. All right, Angel wrote, she, I don't think she's actually on, she's been watching on Facebook Live, good. Um, oh. She's just very excited uh, to, uh, about what we're doing and looking forward to returning to the conference in person. Yeah, we're all very excited to come back in person. I will guarantee you, Rachel, or uh, Angel, we're very happy to be in person again. Um, uh, Chris asked a very good question about submitting uh, separately for the conference in 365 format. So if it is a very different topic than submit 
twice, right? Uh, if it's a different topic that you're going to submit for the conference or a different topic you would submit for the webinar, then of course that's a separate presentation. But very easily you could submit it for a webinar or a, one of the conference sessions and then put in that one question, uh, like what's the other formats that you would consider uh, and then tell me how it would be different if it were a 90 minute workshop versus a podcast or a webinar, uh, which has of course very different lengths and formats. Uh, how might it be different? Um, so that's really the best place to do that. If it's the same topic, same basic presentation you want to do, just in a shorter version or a longer version, just answer it in that question. Um, let's see. Judy has a long, a long question because I, I read it earlier. It says multiple options. Uh, let's see. More about PDLs. So yes, indeed, these really are intended to be deep dives. Uh, they're intended to be action oriented so that at the, at the end, whether you have um, an action tool that you would use, or you can use ours because we've created one for the PDLs if, in a default setting. Um, what is the person going to actually do? So they think about it before they leave the session. We've talked about lots of stuff, whatever the topic is, and what is their action that they're going to do? That's the key thing for the professional development labs. A lot of small group work, a lot of conversation. Uh, learning from each other, and then ultimately, what are you personally or for your organization going to do? That's kind of the key to the PDLs. Um, she talks about strategic partnerships. Always happy to talk about that with anybody because um, you never know what might come of those. I've I've had people approach me in the last year who attended a conference back in 2011 and now wants to work with the forum to create some conferences specifically for their organization. That's really exciting. And that's definitely a very strategic partnership opportunity. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find the other questions you had in, in experiential learning opportunities. So before the pandemic, we actually had several sessions where we actually took people, one session in particular, we took people out on a bus to tour areas in the Twin Cities that had specific racial histories, uh, things that had been redlined before, parts of the city that had been uh, the center of African-American culture and life within the city and how it has changed and how it might be coming back, just to get a feel for what was even happening in our city. I know that Best Buy many years ago used to send their executives to Memphis, where I'm from actually, to the Lorraine Hotel and to the Civil Rights Museum there to ex examine what it was like to be a, a person of color in a majority, majority minority city like Memphis is and to experience the history of Dr. Martin Luther King, right? So that's a little outside the scope of the forum, of course, but things that people can actually experience within that three hour session. And it could be think tank related, it could be uh, a more doing. We've actually had, um, we had one experiential session a couple years ago that was actually doing art within the confines of the, of the presentation. So as an example, um, let's see, Eden says, can a future session take place away from the hotel? I think I just answered that, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it can. Uh, and we did. We actually had a sponsor for that particular feature session I referenced earlier. Um, uh, it was the uh, YMCA here in, in Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, so that helped pay for the transportation part. And then we brought the, the participants in that session back to the YMCA where they have a race exhibit. And so not only did they get to see some spaces in Minneapolis had racial connotations historically and otherwise, but then they got to go back to this race exhibit that the YM has, a, has, has as a permanent installation and really experience that and have a presentation by the YM about, about, that, present, about that installation. So yes, definitely Eden. Uh, let's see, my session would be 90 minute workshop. This is uh, Sarah, uh, or a three hour immersive a practical app because it includes a practical application of skills uh, should they determine which option to choose. Um, I think go with what you what you think is the best presentation to to make sure that what you want to present is going to have its fullest possibilities. Uh, and then give me the option, should I not have enough space for it in whatever length that might be. Um, tell me how it would work in the in the other length that you've chosen. Uh, so that, then that one question again, a lot of these 
a lot of your questions are about everything getting answered by that one question where it's like, tell me all the other options that are possible. Because uh, I definitely make note of those and I, and I, and I follow your lead uh, in that question to find other ways of programming what you've proposed. Let's see. Well, we have lots of stuff, a lot more questions. Goodness. Um, is it possible to submit multiple proposals for different topics? Yes, already answered that. Yes, we have. Um, uh, let's see. Will this recording be made available at the session? Yes, we plan on it to be recorded. We tried to do that last time, and for whatever reason, it wouldn't render. We recorded it, and then the system didn't work. But this one is being recorded, as I see, and we will have it up on our website uh, later this week or, or possibly next week. Would a spotlight series also be compatible for virtual people who are unable to attend? We are, um, yes, the spotlight series, in fact, is going to be pre recorded and will, will be a part of the virtual presentation. So it is absolutely a, a virtual opportunity. And with on demand, the in person people will also be able to view it uh, uh, either when we program it in the virtual space or after the conference is over. Hi, Queuing. Uh, our topics related to well-being, should I select healthcare, DEI strategy, or DEI leadership? Oh, that's a good question. Typically, if it's healthcare, it's about the healthcare industry. I actually have a, a, a topic area that I select on, on um, wellness and well-being, uh, and that could be leadership, that could be employment practices, uh, it really kind of depends on, it, and sometimes they fall kind of in between and I have to make selections. Uh, but unless it's about the healthcare industry, probably put it in one of the other tracks instead of uh, in healthcare. Let's see. My, uh, this is from Richard. My proposed talk is on cultural intelligence. However, are most people more familiar with the terms cultural agility or cultural competence? Richard, it, it, it falls everywhere. Um, I think the default probably is un, under cultural competence. But actually, one of my other topic areas that I search for is under agility as well. So I imagine the default is probably cultural competence overall, uh, as far as language to use. I think I've got, looks like we got all thank yous. All right. Uh, not seeing any other questions and knowing that a lot of people have left, of course, because we have definitely over time. I'm going to close this out for today. If you want to know more, obviously email us and we'll be happy to set up uh, either answer by email or set up a time to talk. And we're, I'm very much looking forward to reading your proposals and engaging with you for the next year of the forum 2023. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.